Hello everyone, this is the um, overview of chapter 9. And chapter 9 is uh, a chapter that uh, is focused on how we interact with one another socially. Um, and at first glance you might think, well, you know, that how really important is that? Um, but the reality is that how we interact with others, whether um, it's at school or it's at work or um, perhaps at, at a religious um, a congregation of some sort, whether that's a temple, a synagogue, a mosque, a church, etc. Um, how we interact um, when we're with friends, etc. All of that um, does shape how we think and how we feel about the world around us. And so, um, in this chapter, there's a there's a focus on how these associational uh, relationships are developed and how they are influenced. Uh, continue to be influenced by what has happened in in the past. So, um, first off, you know we should recognize that for most of the world's history, um, people were segregated uh, into their own little communities, uh, and so it what it's not that it's so unusual for humans today to continue to to segregate themselves into different communities and churches and um, civic organizations, etc. Um, that, that shouldn't be a surprise. That's what humans have been doing um, our whole existence on this planet. Um, of course, starting in the 19th and 20th centuries, that, well, starting more in the 19th century, the early 1800s, um, and the 20th century, the push became stronger for there to be more uh, inclusion um, of people from different walks of life in the various associations or organizations in the United States. And certainly um, after slavery was abolished uh, by the 13th Amendment, African Americans really began to um, be able to achieve some degree of success. And um, I, one thing that um, comes to mind is uh, some of the ways in which members of the African-American community, or the black community, as we typically say today, after slavery was abolished, whether these individuals were um, former slaves or whether their children um, became um, professionals, people went to school, they earned degrees. Of course, they had to go to historically, what were then just black colleges and universities. Today, we call them HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. Um, and they became doctors and lawyers and architects and engineers, etc. And many of them gained some, uh, you know, a fair degree of success. And as a result, um, some of these um, educated and uh, professional individuals tried to create all black communities, or at least parts of a, the com of, a uh, of a community that were all black. And um, I'm listening to a podcast right now. Um, on Wondery uh, about uh, the Tulsa massacres and what happened um, near in Tulsa, near Tulsa, in an area that was once known as uh, as Greenwood, um, and this was an area of Tulsa that was it was called the Black Wall Street because people who lived there were um, blacks who had achieved some degree of success. Many of them were professionals. Uh, others were entrepreneurs, they owned uh, stores and uh, movie theaters, etc. Um, but it was destroyed um, in 1921. Um, and those individuals never fully were able to recover financially, um, let alone um, physically and mentally, from the trauma of um, what happened over the course of about a day and a half um, in um, late May. Uh, 1921. So um, again, thinking about how people just almost naturally, you know, that old saying, birds of a feather flock together, people almost naturally um, want to be around people who are like themselves. Having said that, what we do know is that m there is much to be gained by having more inclusion and diversity within our organizations. And I say inclusion and diversity because there's a recognition today that didn't exist 
um, up until probably 2010 or so, we were, we, for a long time, we were only talking about diversity, right? We need more diversity uh, on college campuses. We need more diversity uh, in the workplace. We need more diversity in civic organizations. We need more diversity in, pol in political leadership roles, et cetera. But the reality is that you can have diversity um, and not a lot changes. What most people recognize today is that unless you also have inclusion, then diversity is fairly useless because inclusion is the next step. Yes, you have the people at the workplace with, on the campus, etc., who come from various backgrounds. But with inclusion, you then are also making efforts to actually have these individuals um, sit at the table with others who are making decisions, with those who have power. They're sharing in the power. They're sharing in the decision-making. Um, their experiences are an important part of what the organization does. That's the inclusion piece. And so now what people uh, are typically saying is DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because again, we recognize that just because you have diversity doesn't mean that everyone is able to perform in the same way because not everybody had same opportunities prior to the time that they get to the organization that we might be talking about, whether that's education or the workplace, etc. So, um, of course, after slavery was abolished, um, then, if, this is my opinion, and you can certainly disagree with this, um, but it seems as though whites were anxious, for lack of a better word, maybe even fearful, of the, and definitely envious of the success that black people seem to be having, at least some black people seem to be having. And, and so um, there was this movement to segregate, which is of course what we know as uh, Jim Crow, the Jim Crow laws. Um, and of course, then we know in 1954, 19, 1896, sorry, 1896, uh, with the Plessy versus Ferguson, Case that that was you know the nail in the coffin where segregation was completely legal, um, which meant then that whites could do everything that they needed to, they felt they needed to to remain uh, to have their communities remain white, um, and so of course as a result, then it typically meant that people who were not allowed to join a particular fraternity or go to a particular school or go to a particular church, etc., then those non-white organizations sprang up. So that is why we have those HBCUs. That's why we have um, Catholic universities and Mormon universities and, um, well, all female institutions are few and far between now. I think there are maybe just a handful left in the United States. Most of them have merged with um, uh, co-ed institutions, um, but even women's um, colleges also were created because women were locked out of uh, going to school where men typically went to school. And so there was a way for people who were prohibited from joining in to some of these organizations. Um, many of them just decided, okay, well, we'll do our own thing then. Um, and many of them did it fairly well. Um, of course, there were also some who believed that one key way to make real change was to try to integrate uh, associations and for people to try to work together. Um, and of course, there, here are some listed here um, that early on were very interested in trying to make sure that whites and blacks and other marginalized groups were able to work together. Um, and there's a quick example here of the YWCA, of course, many religious organizations of the time, um, I'm talking here of the latter part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th century, uh, were segregated. In fact, today, most churches are still quite segregated. Um, there's very little diversity in, in many churches throughout the United States. Um, and so, um, in 1920, um, black women pushed the YWCA, Young Women's Christian Association, to integrate. Um, they also pushed the YWCA to dedicate itself to fighting racism. And so the YWCA did transform itself um, to be one of the first 
um, anti-racist, fully integrated organizations that was, whose membership was all female. Okay. Um, and so uh, you see their slogan there, eliminating racism, empowering women. Um, of course, we know that there were some whites who believed that um, racial discrimination was abhorrent, uh, and they believed that blacks should have um, the same opportunities that they had, and they were willing to work with organizations um, that were working on, on the goal of racial integration. Um, now, we know, too, that there were some um, blacks in particular who had the notion, who had the idea that trying to integrate um, black people with white organizations and communities probably wasn't going to, to work that well. Um, and in earlier chapters, you learned about Marcus Garvey. Uh, he was the gentleman that um, was uh, uh, the founder of the movement, the, the Back to Africa movement. Now, you know, we know that there weren't a whole lot of uh, former slaves and descendants of, of slaves um, who went back to Africa, um, but that's one example of someone who said, hey, look, no matter what we do, no matter how good we are, how smart we are, um, whites will never accept us as fully um, equal to them, and so it's better for us just to go back to Africa. Um, the Nation of Islam came along in the 20th, early, early part of the 20th century, I believe, 1920s, 1930s, um, and initially was led by uh, a man named Elijah Muhammad. Um, of course, um, Nation of Islam is not Islam. It is different um, from Islam that is, was originating in um, the area that we now call Saudi Arabia, where Mecca is, where people who are Muslim make pilgrimages to. This Nation of Islam is a, an American creation by a, um, a black man, in particular Elijah Muhammad and others. Um, and the focus of, of the Nation of Islam was really to help black people um, develop their, their powers, um, develop fully their skills to become educated, uh, to support one another, and to um, cleanse themselves of the thoughts of inferiority okay, um, that they may have assimilated. And of course, one of the most famous um, persons who uh, converted to Nation of Islam was Malcolm X. Um, unfortunately, he was uh, assassinated. Um, depending upon what you read and what movies you watch, you, you may believe that Elijah Muhammad had something to do with his assassination or that perhaps somebody in uh, the U.S. government had something to do with it, or somebody else. Um, it's not really ever been fully proven. Um, and so really the focus was on, we want black people to support each other. We want black people to, to lift each other up. Um, and of course, one of the things uh, that members of Nation of Islam are typically um, identified by is the fact that the men wear suits, um, and um, are very clean cut, and the women wear uh, dresses um, that are longer, you know, past the knees, uh, and many of them cover their hair. And okay. so um, they dress very modestly. Um, that's one of the, the, the ways you can identify somebody who might be a Nation of Islam member. Um, you know, unfortunately for, and, and you, you, we could think of a Nation of Islam as being part of black nationalism, and that's just one piece. Uh, of course, the Black Panthers were part of black nationalism. Um, black Power was another part of black nationalism. During the 1950s and 60s, there were, there were various groups that were engaged in um, what we could think of as black nationalism, this idea that black people should stick together, they should raise themselves up and support one another and tap into the power that they have as a group rather than um, as individuals. Um, now, you know, the, the separate black nation never came um, as black nationalism, um, pro you know, proposed that it would. Um, and that lot, a large part of that is because more people believed that racial integration um, should be the, the goal. Um, and 
the Nation of Islam still does exist. Um, there are various congregations around um, LA in particular. I live up here in Utah, I don't know if there are any up here, um, but they're still around. Um, and there are people who still uh, strongly believe that black people um, are, are, can tap into their power and support one another um, better than trying to get into this uh, realm of racial integration. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, let's focus on the immigrant experience um, in civic participation. Um, for many immigrants, uh, language is, is a barrier. Um, and not just in terms of civic participation, but also uh, in terms of being able to find a job. Right? If you can't speak English very well or you don't speak any English, then you, may, you, you are very limited in what kind of job you can get. But in addition to that, even for your children's schooling, you may not be able to advocate fully for your child simply because your, your language skills um, are lacking in English. And so you can't advocate as well as you might if somebody were able to speak um, in your native language. Now, of course, today, many school districts, particularly in large metropolitan areas like LA, San Francisco, San Diego, Oakland, etc., do have people on staff who are able to communicate in various languages with immigrant parents. So things have definitely improved. Um, but, you know, if you want to go to City Hall and talk about a proposed, um, I don't know, store that's going to be built in your neighborhood or a proposed um, freeway that's going to be built near where you live, etc., that may not be something you feel comfortable doing because of a language barrier. Um, or also because you don't know how things work in this country. You don't understand how they work. Um, of course, there's also um, the fact that for many immigrants, they often are working jobs where they can't necessarily leave work whenever they want to, to go to a um, city council meeting or to go to a um, teacher conference, etc. cetera. Um, and so when immigrants come in um, is, another, is another factor. People who are more recent immigrants tend to participate less, but even those who've been here for a long time, uh, many of them have, may have lived in ethnic enclaves um, for so long that they, they really haven't had to uh, expand their participation outside of that ethnic enclave. Um, but there may be, within those ethnic enclaves, um, some voluntary organizations that, are, uh, that, that cater to uh, that are for or created by people who are, are immigrants. Um, let's think a little bit about homophily. Homophily uh, is a fancy word meaning simply that we like to be around people who are like us. Right? We tend to um, engage in homophily when we marry somebody of the same uh, religion, same uh, ethnic group, uh, same level of education, etc. Um, in fact, it seems easier for people to associate um, outside of their social class, their religion, and their educational level than it is for them to interact with people from different racial and ethnic groups. Um, and so, again, homophily is something that as humans we seem to be hardwired to prefer. Boundary work is um, one of the ways, um, because we have multiple ways uh, in which people try to navigate the the world around them, the social um, boundaries that are around them, um, whereby we may feel comfortable in some groups because they're familiar to us, but we may feel less comfortable in other another group because it is unfamiliar to us or less familiar to us. We may feel more welcomed in one um, social group and less welcome in another. Uh, we may feel we're, that when we're part of a group that we are part of us, and we may feel when we're another group that we're, we're viewed as them, the others. Um, and so it's just the way that people learn, uh, boundary work is just the way that people learn how to navigate those different areas of their lives. Um, and so here's a quick example. 
Um, when you go to work, um, I'm guessing a lot of you have jobs. When you go to work, you may or may not feel uh, comfortable there. Um, maybe you feel comfortable there because you've worked there for some time and people who work with you um, are about the same age and maybe have similar goals and so maybe that's very familiar to you and you feel comfortable there. But maybe you get a different job and now let's say you're working in a law office and you're working in the mailroom. Well maybe now you feel less comfortable there because you don't know anything about law um, and lawyers and um, paralegals, law clerks, they all seem to look down on people who are like you working in the mailroom. And so we learn how to navigate those different social um, groups and how we feel within those social groups. Now, of course, um, as I said, we've, we've pushed since at least the 1940s and 50s for more diversity. And even more recently, as I said, in about 2010 or so, we started talking about inclusion as well. For people of different backgrounds, and I'm talking here not just about ethnicity, but about religion, social class, levels of education, different types of social sexual orientation, etc., sexual identity. Um, we've been trying to push for more of this integration of people from various backgrounds rather than keeping everything um, solely uh, focused on one group or another. However, while multiculturalism is still viewed by many to be um, the, the end result that we should be striving for, um, as you have seen in um, some of the early work I should do, the neo-segregation paper, but also if you just think about some of the, the groups that exist today. Um, for example, um, in some states, for example in Texas, um, Governor Abbott, Greg Abbott, has um, said that he will sign a bill um, that would criminalize um, this behavior. A parent who takes their children or child to a doctor so that the child can have um, gender conforming medical treatment, meaning, you know, maybe hormones if it's a trans student, um, some sort of hormone therapy to help that trans. Um, child appear to be more like the um, sex that they identify with. That would be a criminal act. Um, and of course, there are many people who think that that's stupid. Uh, why would you criminalize a parent doing what they believe is the best thing for their child? If their child identifies as trans and would like um, some medical help to be able to look more like the sex they identify with, why should that be a criminal act? Um, but enough legislators in Texas think it's a good idea and Abbott will likely sign the bill if he hasn't already. Um, so we know though that while inclusion and diversity are noble goals, there are still times when people may want to continue to self-segregate. Um, and to me there's a, there's a huge difference between self-segregation where we choose to associate within a particular social group because of homophily versus segregation which is forced upon you. Um, and so separation is what I, the term I prefer to use. Rather than self-segregation, I prefer to use the term separation because that's voluntary, whereas segregation is something that is forced on someone. Um, and so I don't think it's a bad idea to have both sorts of organizations. Um, I don't understand why it's bad to have both kinds. Um, if we only had um, the voluntary ones, um, then that would be a problem. Or if we only had the forced um, you know, separation, the segregation, then that would be a bad thing. But if we have both, then people can decide for themselves where they want to be. Um, all right. One thing that, of course, a lot of um, there's been a lot of talk about in the last oh I don't know 15 20 years now is what is often called identity politics. Identity politics is this idea that 
um, people belong to political uh, groups or they be become engaged in political uh, groups that address a particular unique interest uh, that they have. Um, and so BLM could be considered a one type of um, political action that is identity politics. So could uh, LGBTQ plus organizations that are engaged in political action to address unique interests of that group, uh, et cetera. Um, but the reality is that when you really sit down and talk to most people, as some researchers have done, most people want the same things. They want to uh, be respected. They want to um, have the same rights as others. They want to be able to live a life free of oppression and discrimination. They want to be able to rear their children um, without being judged um, because they are same-sex parents or because they're, um, you know, interracial couple, etc. Um, most people want the same things. Um, we don't really, identity politics doesn't really seem to be tearing us apart. We just go about it differently in terms of trying to secure that, those things that are core values or core needs or desires. Um, we're just going about it slightly differently. But it seems like most people want the same thing. And um, here's this um, from the textbook, which again, I think is very uh, much highlights who, uh, you know, what a term means, whether it means something good or whether it means something bad. So when you look at Charlton Heston, who by the way, um, he's no longer alive, but he was an actor and a very staunch Republican, very conservative, uh, religious, etc. Um, this looks like, I don't know when he said this, but he, this, he said at some point, Political correctness is tyranny with manners. Uh, whereas Toni Morrison, who is no longer with us, unfortunately, she died I don't know, four or five years ago, I think, um, a writer and a poet and an actor, um, she said, what I think the political correctness debate is about is the power to be able to define. The definers want the power to name, and the defined are now taking that power away from them. Okay, so again, two different views of what does it mean. Um, I personally don't like the term political correctness. I prefer to think of it as civility. Try not to say things or do things um, to offend people who have been historically marginalized. Um, I don't see it as censoring speech. Um, I just view it as civility. So here's Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Um, uh, if I, if a coworker asks me, how do you like my new outfit? Or how do you like my new haircut? And I don't like it, I probably won't say that. Why? Just because I'm, I wanna be civil. I don't wanna hurt someone's feelings. I don't wanna offend that person. Um, I'm not going to say, what the fuck were you thinking when you chose that outfit? Or wh what the hell did you do? Why did you let somebody do that to your hair? I'm not going to say that. And to me, that's not political correctness. It's simply civility. It's kindness. Just not saying how you really feel. Um, I don't view it as dishonesty. I view it as civility, as kindness. Because there's really no reason to hurt someone's feelings just because you have an opinion that's very different from theirs. So that's why I hate the term political correctness, but you will hear it quite a bit. But that's my, my take on how to view it. All right, so um, white nationalism. Um, <laughs> you might be surprised to see this map because um, California um, is one of three states that have seven or more uh, hate groups uh, in the state. Now, hard, California is known as a very progressive, deeply blue state that's ahead of the game on so many issues in the United States, and yet hate groups have found a way to thrive in deep blue California. Um, now, the other two are not much of a surprise. There's West Virginia up there in the other yellow, and um, 
I don't even know what that other yellow one is. I have to admit to my ignorance when it comes to um, when it comes to geography. But what is notable to me is, but and not surprising by the way, is that Hawaii, that little chain here of islands, this is Hawaii, um, has none. Um, and if you've ever been to Hawaii, um, you can probably figure out why. Is there's so much diversity there, and people have intermarried over so many generations that um, there, you know, there, there's Filipino heritage uh, in Hawaii, there's Chinese heritage, there's Korean heritage, Japanese heritage, traditional Hawaiian heritage, and yes, and yes, uh, white heritage. There are there's Mexican heritage now there. Um, so there's so much diversity there, and and these islands are so small that it's difficult um, to really get a stronghold, I think, for a hate, for a hate group to get a stronghold, and I, I think that's a good thing. Um, other areas where apparently there are none, surprising to me, um, is uh, are New Mexico, Utah, um, I believe that this is Nebraska, um, uh, Louisiana is here, uh, I think this might be Kansas. This might be Oklahoma. Again, I must say that my knowledge of geography is, is pretty bad. Um, but again, I just wanted to point out that um, yep, everywhere else, uh, except for these purple places, um, there are hate groups. Okay, so not, not very surprising. Um, and it all kind of worked out um, that the hate group discussion is, is um, in, this, in this module. Um, because um, it's an interesting um, talk by someone who used to belong to uh, a white supremacist group and his experiences uh, while in the group as well as what helped him to get out of that sort of mindset. Um, so I hope that you enjoy that, that video. Um, uh, oh, this is something that um, has been in the news quite a bit since um, March 2020. I mean, we knew that the digital divide existed, but of course it was exacerbated um, with the um, pandemic that began in March 2020 and is pretty much still with us today, although I think some people are now calling it endemic rather than pandemic, although it's still pretty much everywhere in the world. So I think still it's a pandemic. Um, but, you know, there are many people, particularly low-income individuals, and of course, um, many um, low-income individuals um, are, are non-whites. Um, they do not have um, access to either any internet access or the access they have is very spotty. You know, it comes and it goes. Um, of course, virtual learning is difficult um, for, for children. Uh, it's even difficult for adults. You know, not all adults like um, virtual education. So. Clearly, we've seen some disadvantages between people who have money and have access to fast computers, high-speed internet, etc., and kids who don't have those things. And yes, there are poor black kids too. I mean, poor white kids too. Um, of course, racism and sexism and homophobia and Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, you know, all of, all of the isms uh, and hate, different types of hate, um, have been able to prosper, really, or prosper is not the right word, to, to foster, to, to hmm, expand, to expand with all of the different types of social media. Um, and when people are able to be anonymous, um, it seems they get meaner. Um, even when people are not anonymous, um, people are still willing to put their names to things. Um, things like Tinder, Grindr, I use a Nextdoor app, um, for my neighborhood, and people sometimes post on there some pretty stupid things. Um, let's see. Uh, religious organizations, uh, I'll let you check uh, check that out on your own. It's um, pretty self-explanatory about how there's a lot of um, intolerance um, within the United States when it comes to our uh, religion, which is always surprising to me. Um, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in any kind of higher power or any kind of organized religion, but it's always shocking to me because the little, you know, I, I went to catechism uh, as a kid. I grew up in a home that was kind of sort of Catholic. We were the convenient Catholics. 
Um, and so I did go to catechism to make First Communion. I was baptized, make First Communion, and then Confirmation. And what I remember from the religious teachings um, within the Catholic Church is that, you know, Jesus loved everybody, he washed a prostitute's feet, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, God says, treat others the way you want to be treated, you know, all those kinds of things. And so it's always shocking to me, even as an atheist, that religion is one of those things that seems to, to harbor people with deep hatreds uh, of others. Um, and that, that just shocks me because you know, that's, at least that's not what Christianity is supposed to be about, nor any other major religion that I know a little bit about. All right, um, let's see. All right, I think, I think I'm done uh, with this chapter. The rest of it is stuff you can, you can uh, read about. So uh, I'll see you for chapter 10. Over to you.